It is such a pleasure to finally have on the Reading with Robin show one of my favorite, favorite authors. Kelly Corrigan is the author of the New York Times bestselling Glitter and Glue, The Middle Place and Lift. She is, we were just talking about the YouTube <laughs> transcending, which is today unbelievably 10 years old. I mean, it is amazing how something can seem like I've just seen it and I was just sharing it with friends and that you're telling me that it's 10 years ago and that is just absolutely crazy. She's also the host and founder of Notes and Words, an annual million dollar benefit concert featuring writers and musicians at the Fox Theater in Oakland. Kelly lives outside San Francisco with her husband and two teenage daughters and she's out on tour. Her brand new book, Tell Me More and 11 Other Important Things I'm Learning to Say is out now. You're going to love it, and you're going to want to get it for all your friends. Welcome to Reading with Robin Kelly. Hey, how are you? I'm well. I am. You can. I, I was just listening to uh, to barking in the background, but it seems to have ceased. So I think we're good. I. This is just one of those books I'm buying for all my girlfriends. I, I can only imagine what your events are like and what people want to share with you, especially with a new book called Tell Me More. Do you open yourself up for that? <laughs> I know, but I love that. That's really like the bent, the payoff for me is taking it out and meeting readers and hearing what, you know, it's, it's a set of 12 phrases that I find like infinitely useful. And it's interesting to me to hear from other people about what, uh, what, they, what their go-to phrases are. Like in, in most cases we agree that the 12 I've come up with and written about uh, are super valuable, but there are also others that either I had set aside because I didn't have quite the right set of stories to Mm -hmm. explore the idea, or I maybe save for another book someday. And Mm -hmm. uh, I just get such a kick out of hearing what other people, what their go-to lines are. I think that someone said to me recently that I really loved was not yet. Uh, not yet. We'll see is you one of the ones. Kind of le- yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Although when, when we would say we'll see, the kids figured out somehow that we'll see was closer to a yes and a maybe. There was something between a maybe and a we'll see, and which was better. Which one had held more hope, more promise. Yeah. Right? And, and I see th- in my house was like, I'm not talking to you about this anymore, and I'm going to tell you no later when I'm a oh. monster fit about it. <laughs> and it's amazing, right, how those phrases, kids quickly pick up on what it really means or what they, they hope to hear. Um, there's yeah. something like trying to ask for something when your parent's a little bit distracted and hoping for a different, <laughs> a different response. Um, oh. And so how did, how did the idea for this book come up? Um, it's, I think I was reading around that conversation. I was, we, we had this kind of dinner table debate about which is um, – which is more effective, to say I'm sorry or to say I was wrong? And I was feeling like I'm sorry is kind of overused, and it's often used with this snarky tone of voice, like I'm sorry, or I'm sorry you felt that way. And it, and it just, um, I don't know, it's just kind of tired and, and often insincere. And so I was saying that I think it's a bigger statement, a statement of more um, humility and culpability to say I was wrong. And, and that's it. I, I was wrong. Nothing after I it. No wrong. but. No. Yeah. Yeah. No but. No but. Um, and so that that got the conversation going in this broader direction, which is like, what are the things that these statements that are just required if you're going to be in adult relationships, you know, if you're going to be in long-term, complex, permanent relationships like we have with our family members, our, both our family of origin and our maid family, like what do you really have to be able to say? You have to be able to say every now and then, no. You have to be able to say, I was wrong. You have to be able to say, I don't know. And so that's where it started. And then I I kind of obsessed over it for a while. And the more I would bring it up with people on walks and such, the more stories I was finding were kind of attaching themselves to each of these sentences. And so then it became like this collection of stories, and each one is centered on a single sentence. I love the way the 
the idea for the book comes and the discussion that you'd have around the table and then also in your fashion and your essays and everything that you write that I just so take to heart and love to read and share with people. It's like that conversation with Kelly. You're reading it in the book, but I can see how as you're out in the world sharing it with people, it, it takes form and it's so thought-provoking. And that's why I say it's the kind of book that I love to give to friends. And it's a great book club pick for the same reason. I mean, the discussions that you would have and the stories. I mean, it's all about the storytelling and connecting to each other. So that's what gets, you know, that's what gets the stories going. And these, and these are really true. I mean, I read this book and I just nodded along and thought, yeah, uh-huh, that makes sense. Yes. And, um, and you want someone to say I was wrong when they were, you know, really it's very validating to be right. <laughs> we'll have to know yeah. that somebody was wrong. And your chapter on yes is very cute. It's it's short, but just listing off the things that you, you say yes to. Do, do people then hold you accountable? Well, the book's just out now. And I'm on the phone with yeah. Kelly Corrigan. Tell me more and 11 other important things I'm learning to say. It's just such a, an ongoing experience, life, right? And and it's it's so active and learning. And, um, and I don't know is a really hard thing to say. You know, um, that was probably one of the most um, important sentences to me. And, in fact, that chapter could have gone on for 100 pages. I mean, a person could write a book easily, write a book about learning to live with the unknowns yeah. and the unknowable. And so there were so many stories that um, connected to that idea of uncertainty and unknowability. So one of the stories I tell in there is my friend Mary Hope, who – had unresolved fertility issues and ended up adopting after six or seven years of um, fertility treatments and various attempts. And, you know, she, she never will know why, why it, it unfolded that way. And you, know, you don't know if the doctor you're working with is the right doctor and you don't know if um, stress is involved and you don't know if this was meant to be. And it's really – a huge distraction and and uh, it takes up a lot of mind space, yeah. a dangerous amount of mind space, wondering why. And if you mm-hmm. make it your project to understand why things are the way they are, I think you're going to lose a lot of time that could be better spent operating within the reality as it is. You know, That's like our kids yeah. are so different than we think they're going to be. Mm-hmm. And then they have a a habit of mind or a habit or a behavior that comes out of nowhere, quote unquote, and we just want to understand, is that because I sent them to camp too early? Is that because, (laughs) um, you know, they live so far away from their grandparents? Is that because, you know, I yelled too much when they were young and the desire to know, like nothing could be more human than to want to come up with a rationale or an explanation for why things are the way they are. But, Nothing could be more futile either. I mean, it's just not, we're just not going to know. We're not going to know why people break up with us or why we don't get a job or where that breast cancer came from or, you know, and, and it's a myth. It's a, it's a persistent myth that maybe we will know that there is an answer and it's just a huge distraction. So that chapter just went on and on and on for me. Like then I started tipping into faith and thinking about, how my parents were such Catholics of such conviction. Like they really did feel like they knew, um, you know, what happens after you die and they knew the nature of reality and they knew what the kind of ultimate governing body of the universe is. And they lived in a homogenous society in Baltimore, Maryland, mm-hmm. a long time ago when everybody was Catholic and everybody they knew did ate fish on Fridays and, you know, got their confirmation when they were 13. And so there wasn't the heterogeneity that draws everything into question and, like, throws everything up in the air. And um, so anyway, I, I think it's a really important thing to face. I think it's a, a thing to be, like, looked at eyeball to eyeball like there are just some things that you can't know and i love the way you you mention uh, the way you wrap it around time spent and the time that we can never get back you know musing over things or the sense of trying to create a 
a reason or an order so that, of course, it can't then happen again or something similar or all of these yes, things. Yes, right. You, right? I mean, and you really sort of under I don't know, um, I guess accepting or, like you say, all of those different things of what if this had gone that way and this and this is why we're here, you know, and this sort of like let's move forward. And it's it all does come down to time and how we want to spend it. And, you know, certainly you talk about um, – 36 or 37 when you were diagnosed yeah so you know yeah Yeah, and interestingly like every single person said was it in your family oh yeah i read that part yeah god they really want that to be the story yes of course feel in their posture and in their tone of voice Mm -hmm. the way they're looking at me that they just (laughs) it would make them so happy if i could say yes (laughs) was. Uh, I, I know. I That is such a familiar and resounding um, theme in things that happen to people. Um, I know that when yeah. somebody, you know, somebody has a heart attack, everyone's like, were they overweight? They yeah. smoked. Did they smoke? They yeah. smoked. They, you know, <laughs> it's just, I know. And, and you understand this, this universal theme of wanting to make sure that this won't happen or be preventable but you could so you can tell when somebody is asking you that what they want to hear sure and like, i've been can, that first you know like when yeah. you find out that a marriage uh is ending like between <laughs> friends right you just want to keep asking them questions until they tell you something that distinguishes it from your own marriage exactly yeah so the right. closer the, the closer it mirrors your marriage the more danger you're in mm-hmm and you can, and I know that. I mean, I know my friend Melissa, who after she got divorced, like she said, every married person she knew was kind of digging around for that distinguishing feature so that they could feel safe again. Yeah, yeah. It's a scary. It's life is scary. You know, unknowing. It is. Who who knows? Pardon? It yeah. It is. It really is. It's, and it, and and it's kind of it's not a tolerable state to walk around with this you know, really present awareness of our mortality or of our vulnerability, um, that, that's, that's not functional, and, and we're not built for that. You know, we're, we're at, at an animal level. That's not where, that's not where we live. Um, mm-hmm. But when you get close to it, as I did with my dad and as I did with Liz, my friend yeah. who died. I'm so sorry, the, yeah. The two informing experiences that are underneath like every page of this book yeah then you that really takes you to a place of like wanting to get your life in order and and wanting to earn your life like be good enough for your good fortune like you know like the the very last line of the book is the most important line to me which is um your profoundly ordinary daughter your profoundly ordinary kid Oh, in the shower. In the shower. Yes. And you get to be here to hear it. I know. And I, that really stops you when you're reading that because certainly, and you talk about, I mean, the love, all that surrounds all of these stories for your dad. And I remember reading about the two of you being diagnosed around the same time at the, you know, thing, and hearing, um, you know, and listening to the story on YouTube, the transcending story. And every, if you haven't seen that video, Everybody, I mean, that was floating around and continues to float around like over what five million times. I mean, it's everywhere. But you must, you must read that. But and also your friend Liz and being being able to, it, what a privilege it is to be there for our children, for our families, for the life that we've created. And so in those ordinary moments, you sort of stop and go, okay, this is this is doesn't get really much better than this. And you now, and that's not right. a moment and that it's, you'll be seeing on enough. Facebook. It, yeah, yeah. Like, that's and, one of the sentences that I really like a lot, too, is good enough. Like, that we better we better redefine, like, what's good enough. Because we live in this kind of dangerously quantitative world where we're putting ourselves out there for judgments, likes, follows, thumbs up. And <laughs> we better remember, like, what we think is good enough. Right. Rather than what they, they, rather than handing that over and saying, "Is this good enough?" Like we should have our own opinion about that, about our our own opinion about our bodies and our houses, and our jobs and our relationships and our car, because there's a lot of bigger forces than a single person out there, like working hard to tell us to redefine 
the standards and, and tell us what's good. And we have to, just alone in our own little hearts and heads, we have to say, that's not what I'm shooting for. And you really make people think with all of your essays and anything I've ever read with the books or things you've posted, it really makes me stop and think. And those are the things I like to really share and certainly share in reading with Robin. And we have three copies. Your publicist was very generous to give us three to give away. So I have three copies of Kelly Corrigan's Tell Me More, which is just out. And you can send me a message on Facebook. That's a good way on Reading with Robin Facebook page. And uh, the winners will be sent notification and they will be very thrilled to read. This is that kind of it makes you really take stock if you're that kind of person and really enjoys thinking and exploring why and connecting to, you know, your voice is just, it's that girlfriend that really kind, it comes across really, your writing comes across as the girlfriend who is able to take a look at herself, admit everything's not so perfect, and I don't know, really enjoy the the parts of a friendship or a piece of a day that just speaks so loudly to, you know, what's meaningful. And I love the reason you talk about three reasons you're a poor candidate for high-end potions and lotions, <laughs> that you're cheap, lazy, and impatient. And I was cracking up. There was one part that makes you a fan of microwave dinners, baseball hats, and the Swiffer. There was one part you talk about, I think your mascara being on from the night before or something, and I was cracking yeah. up because I am the worst at the, I mean, my daughter's always like, it's time to take off your makeup before. I'm like, ugh, it's fine, whatever. I'm right. like, there's so many things that you're writing. I was like, wow, Kelly, it's like showers aren't always necessary all the time. No, I, I, not. I really cracked up. I mean, it all comes down to, to time, calories, and money as far as I'm concerned. And so I think there's a lot of things that you really, like, look at because – it has to really all make sense or, I don't know, not everybody looks at things that way, I suppose, but you can drift along and the years pass and um, and then what? And uh, and so really knowing what's important and Yeah, Yes, and, and, and you know, the very first chapter is called It's Like This, which is um, the least familiar phrase of the yeah. 12. Yeah, yes. And, but it's really important to me because I kept, as people do, I kept losing track of what mattered and what didn't. And I was letting myself be completely undone by, you know, a random combination of annoyances. Like, (laughs) you know, somebody in my family cut their toenails and left their toenails (laughs) on the table. And that just made me, that just took me to, like, my worst, darkest place. Like, I just (laughs) couldn't believe that a person that I had born at great personal expense to my genitals (laughs) <laughs> to grow up to be someone who would cut their toenails and leave them on a surface off which we eat food that I cook. <laughs> was and it just an accident? Fast, they I, meant... was so, I was so mortified by myself for being that mad because right. here I am, lucky to be in this house with these people, lucky to have ever found my guy, lucky to have been able to have a child, lucky for that child to be up and about and so busy that she didn't notice that she left her toenails on the <laughs> kitchen table. <laughs> I think that is hilarious. I mean, and you say you weren't like sure if it was means. toenails or fingernails. I think you weren't really sure. Is that what you <laughs> Some sort of like, wait, what is this? But that, oh, right, sometimes sure. it's it's just like this. It's like, yeah, that isn't, that is not a phrase that I was familiar with, but yet of course reading the essay, it all makes sense. Yes. And also the like forgetting what matters and then returning to it. Like it's like that too. Like it's Mm -hmm. like this for everyone. Nobody is able to like hold the position of awareness and intentionality and, and gratitude. Like, you just keep sliding back into the quotidian nonsense. And then you have to push yourself back into that other place or or get pushed. You know, either someone calls you and tells you they just got diagnosed with cancer and all of a sudden mm-hmm. you're back. But it's like this, you know, you, it's it, this, this pushing and pulling from places of great importance to places that are, you know, kind of laughable. 
It's, it's able, to, yeah, it's so easy to get sucked into that, and, and everybody does. I mean, that's just, we're human. And, and then there's something that just sort of, like you say, you snap back to it, you get, your attention is, is front and center, and you think, wait, what? What was that? It's like this. That's, that's very true. Um, it's like this. It's like this. And the, the chapter um, about um, your husband was talking about, oh, the, um, the gentleman that he sat next to at an event. Yes, the Tell Me More I, chapter. The Tell Me More chapter about um, what happens when you ask questions or that some, you know, I was cracking up that, that he was texting you that it was brutal event, whatever. But then, so boring. So boring, like painful. I can just, I've been, we've been to those kinds of events. And then or talk a little bit about this gentleman. I was just blown away by that. It's crazy. So he's sitting at this thing that he didn't really want to go to, and it's in San Francisco, which from our house is like 45 minutes, best case, and you got to find parking and the whole deal. So it's a little yeah. bit of a, it's a little bit of a thing to get yourself all the way in there. And then he got seated next to this strange man who wasn't really talking very much, and he was just texting me from underneath the table, like brutal, all capital letters, B R U T A L. <laughs> and then on the way home, he called and he said, "You won't believe it." Like something came up about Thailand, and I said to the guy, have you ever been to Thailand? And he said, yes, on the way home from Cambodia, which was where I was a political prisoner for 30 months. And, unbelievable. And, and tells this unbelievable story, the likes of which Edward had never heard before. Wow. And they talked for 45 minutes straight. And Ed was like, by far the most fascinating person I've met in 10 years. Like, the things this man has done and seen and lived through. And then he said this really simple thing, which I I think is so true, is you never know who you're sitting next to. Mm -hmm. And the only way to know is to say, tell me more. And it's right there for the asking. It's not like you have to... Enroll in night school to meet the fascinating people. Like the person sitting next to you right now is probably kind of fascinating in their own way if you can only get the conversation going. If you can only get a couple tell me mores in, you're going to find out that they. I mean, I sat next to a guy at the Nantucket Project last year, which is this organization that I am big, doing a big project with in terms of getting conversation going across the country. Yeah, I was reading kind about of like Aspen Ideas about Fest or um, TED or something like that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, they're, they're rolling out across the country in all these different living rooms. And at one of those events, I was sitting next to a man, and I was doing Tell Me More. And the next thing I know, he tells me the story that his mother was murdered. And he wow. was 14 years old, and the man set the house on fire. Mm. It was like an ex-boyfriend who really resented being uh, left and he lit, he knew she was home, and he lit oh the house God. on fire. And I'm listening to this story thinking, I've been sitting next to you for an hour and a half. And for all I knew, you were like a sales guy from BMW. Like, that's what right, I thought. you would never know, right? And yeah. it's such a gift to know. And people want to tell their stories, too. I mean, I, you're talking to the right person here because I, I go out into my day and I come home with, like, jewels from all over the place because I talk to people. And I can't, you know, people will tell you things. And it's such a treat. And I'm always thinking, wow, if I hadn't gone there and I went there instead of going there and then I went into this person. And I am just so energized by that. And I love, um, not all the time. And enriched. Sometimes, You've been enriched. Oh, like you're, Absolutely. You're, Sometimes I can go, yeah, and then, and there's always a connection and somebody will say something and reminds me of somebody else, or I think of somebody that could be connected to that person or whatever. I just, that's sort of how I go about my day. Sometimes I am just in the like, don't anyone talk to me. You know, I don't always like that, but the hours can pass sometimes. And I think, wow, there were so many exciting things that happened, you know five minutes from the house I didn't go anywhere really but you know I did in some way but I I love hearing stories and um and I think people don't even realize sometimes that they're sharing such a jewel you know and they just yeah are telling you so I I love that I thought that was really great about this um you know that just if somebody doesn't didn't say that they were on their way home from you know whatever however that came up Thailand and Cambodia, and then there it is, this whole amazing story. So, um, you know, just sort of being open to that and chatting with people in a, you know. Yeah, setting it in motion. I mean, you know. Yeah. 
Because there's always the thing behind the thing behind the thing. I mean, that's that's really my true obsession is to get past, like, levels one, two, and three. Like, if life were a big video game, I really <laughs> want to get to the level where people are saying things they haven't said before. They're saying things mm-hmm. that they don't even know how to express. They're, they're talking about things they haven't decided how they feel about something, like, a lot of interaction, to me, it seems like people just repeating themselves, like taking, they took their position on whatever it was, and they've just sort of repeating it in a, a variety of ways and levels of depth wherever they go. And they're not really, they're not really going to change their mind. Like they're the, just sort of on autopilot. Where, yeah. Yeah, kind of, and they're just like throwing around their little lines and. There's little stories, and you know, you know this because you're when you're married, you hear the person do it, and they hear you do it. <laughs> you know, tell you a little story. Oh, now she's going to tell the story about how she had the fender bender, and now she's going to tell the story about how we ordered the pajamas. They were all too small, and you know, whatever. <laughs> and it's yeah. so invigorating to be in a conversation where you're not saying something you've said before, where you're, like, breaking new ground. Well, you can't even believe where it came from sometimes. Like, wait, where did that come from? I can't believe I shared right. this. Or you're not as right. guarded or, right, you're not worried about what somebody's going to say or think or that sort of situation. And you just it's so um, freeing. It is. And I think that's one of those things that so many of these essays sort of circle around living your life and, having it have meaning and your interactions with people. And also that you say saying no makes room for saying yes, which for is sure. so true. I mean, there's only so yeah. much time, and right? And, and I don't know. I just yes, I love everything. You have to – like my mom was such a big part of the chapter on no yeah. because she was really willing to be unpopular in our house and even more broadly. Like she was willing to have people talk about her and say like, well, you know, Mary Corrigan, like, you get one pair of shoes in that family, you know. <laughs> and she didn't have to please anybody or worry what they were saying, which is no. really a strong really remarkable. space to come uh, from. Yeah, very few people, I think. And oh, I find yeah. It very difficult. I know, I know people. I think I'm crazy, like, with some of the parenting choices that we've made, and it's very hard for me to not feel self-conscious about that. Like, it's yeah. a real achievement to not care. Oh, it's huge. It's, I mean, it's, it leaves so much space for other things, like the things you really want to say yes to kind of thing. I love yes, that your mom exactly. didn't need to feel the need to always be where your dad was or people, right? Didn't someone ask you if they were no. divorced? That's how? They had such a liberated – I mean, she was such a liberated woman at a yeah. time when women weren't. She had no sense of, like, obligation with my dad. Like, if yeah. he was into lacrosse games and she liked watching Jeopardy, that's what they <laughs> – and if people were whispering, oh, I think your parents are getting a divorce, which they were, she did not care. It was like, oh, don't be ridiculous. Your That's father and I are never going to get divorced. Love I love father. that. Your father loves me. Oh, I love that. I just think that was so great. And, you know, right, it's, it, she sort of slipped into her own thing little by little until she was like, now you guys go. And then the taking of the two cars, I think that was brilliant. Yeah. Like she had her thing. She wanted to be there. I just, it's, I, I was, it was very admirable and I really enjoyed it. It's just like real practical, like she didn't worry or think and it wasn't that who's whispering or saying. It just, that's what yeah. she wanted to do. And it's, uh-huh. yeah, that's really something. So as a kid, how does that look? Well, I mean, I really, as a kid, I was like, I, you know, you're the you're the meanest mother in Radnor, Pennsylvania. Like, <laughs> nobody has stricter rules than I do. But as a mother now, I mean, I just, I, I find it like, it's very, it's very difficult for me to just let my kids be really mad at me. Mm-hmm. And sure. if you're doing your job, sometimes they're going to be really mad at you. Because sometimes exactly. you're going to say no, like, no, you can't go to the party. And, Absolutely. Or you can't wear that or you can't have that, or we're not going to that. And, you know, your kids really, really, really want it. And especially as teenagers when their social life is so magnified, like the importance of being at every single thing is like sky high. You know, it feels like life oh, or yeah. death. The if end of the world. Pool party, right. you know, you're going to be left out forever. It's going to change the social dynamic of your entire high school experience. <laughs> like it's all on the line all the time. <laughs> And it's very hard for me not to empathize with that. And I remember, I remember high school and I remember 
wanting to be there so badly. Sure. You know? Uh, yeah. So uh, and when they're mad at me, I'm the one who goes up to them to try to make up. They don't come to me. And it's terrible. I mean, I, it's a terrible dynamic I've gotten myself into, and I do not recommend it for anyone. <laughs> I'm just admitting it because it's so pathetic compared to, like, my mother, who was the Rosa Parks of now. Uh, I know. There are things that I've done, too, that I think I can't even imagine what my mother would say of, like, Really, you know, and and I know that I'm tougher than a lot of other of my friends with it. You know, I definitely was one of the unpopular opinion on a lot of I don't care if such and such and uh, you're the only kids that didn't see, you know, and all of that. Um, So I understand that, but you don't ever want them. It's hard to have them angry. I don't, it's hard to ever have someone angry, right? And it may not be because I was wrong. She just went right back to what she was doing. (laughs) Fly out of the kitchen. I hate you, Ray. And she didn't ruminate over it. That was it. That's amazing. It's really, I really don't think she did. I think she just sat right at that kitchen table and like had her Chardonnay on ice. I love it. Some backgammon <laughs> with her buddy and like, just rolled her eyes and laughed. Wow, it sounds like she could give like a week long seminar yeah. with your mom. Might be a fun thing. She could. She could do like a five day. Yeah. Here's here's one way to mother. Did you ever think of doing a, 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 that with her, like in tandem with your mom? Oh, she would never do that, Robin. No. So no, 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 no. <laughs> but the pearls really of like wisdom. Strangers. She doesn't really like strangers. Oh, okay. Then that would not work. Like going to readings is like kind of hard for her. Will you get to see her on this tour? Yes. yes. Okay. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, so. it's the Tell Me More <laughs> tour. I was just going to say that, that I told her that the Philly event was in the evening, and she said, oh, that's kind of late for me. And I said, okay, well, maybe we could do one in the morning, too. And she said, all right, if it's not too icy. <laughs> and I was like, well, is that uh, well, not going to do any of my things? And she's like, Kelly, I read the book. I thought it was wonderful. Oh, that's well. There you go. I mean, you can't get more than that. You, she thought it was wonderful, but you wouldn't. She'll get to it, and it's supposed to be a warm week. You've at least come here. I mean, now that we're thawing out a little bit, it shouldn't be too yeah. icy for your mom in the morning. And people should go to kellycorrigan.com, find her on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, every place. You can like, follow, and validate Kelly any, in any number of places. And <laughs> you, uh, read Tell Me More, and we have three copies. They're available. Um, you can send me a message or post on the Facebook page on Reading with Robin. And it is just – it's full of pearls and gems and laughter and tears. I mean, I certainly had a good cry, um, the chapter with with Liz and um, and your last visit with her. And I really um, – such a tribute to to your friendship and to, like, having that kind of a friendship with somebody. And – I'm so sorry for your loss and your dad, and mm, you're welcome. I mean, you lay it all out there. So are people connecting with all just different parts? I mean, there, you had people that were reading the essays um, or people that read the book ahead, but it's just out now. So were you starting to hear from your readers on these essays? Yeah, and O Magazine ran an excerpt, that, that one chapter about Liz, and how her family is doing now. Oh, I didn't. And is it? Oh, is it in this month? It was in last month, I think. Okay. I think it was the December issue. Okay, it's I'll have to check. Mm-hmm. And um, it's the the word, the sentence for that chapter is onward. Mm. And um, so I have heard from, like I heard from Liz's mom, mm. and a couple of her cousins and her children. And her her husband Andy, who's a great friend of ours, one of my best friends, really, is going to do some readings with me on the oh, West Coast. So he's going to do the LA and San Diego readings. Wow, that's so special! Yeah. And I, I saw you're also reading with um, the wife uh, when Breath Becomes Air. I can't pronounce yes, it. Yeah, right. you're, re- you're reading with her. Yeah, yeah, that's my very last reading. That's the twenty twentieth reading is in Oakland. Wow. And everything's on my website if you're starting to wonder what readings are. It's all there. Yes. It's all Go to all kellycorrigan.com. And, yeah, you have really special readings. You're reading with, um, well, Ariel Levy tonight. And then um, uh, is it Anna Quinlan tomorrow? Anna Quinlan, Daniel Handler, Lucy. 
Wow. Lots of great people. Yeah, I just read it thinking, wow, what a tour. Um, it's the Tell Me More tour and 11 other important things I'm learning to say. Kelly Corrigan, this has been such a treat, and I look forward to having you do an event at some point in Rhode Island or the surrounding area. It would be such an honor to host you. And thank you so much, and I wish you all the best on this tour, and I will be sharing Tell Me More everywhere. It's it's just one of those special Kelly Corrigan books. I mean, that's what it is. Thank you. Thanks, Robin.